Distinguished guests, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Phu Wat. I'm from Meta Vacharak Wat Rai King Hospital. Um, being here at Ratanin Eye Hospital is very special for me because Professor Uthai Ratanin is one of the big reasons why I chose to become an ophthalmologist. So welcome to the first cornea surgery interest group, or CSIC. We changed the name to CSIC for significant um, program, this skills transfer um, course. So the objective of CSIC is a platform for following new development and sharing knowledge and experience among Thai cornea surgeons to elevate and improve the standard of cornea surgery in Thailand, and importantly, for what? For the benefit of our patients. What is CSI? CSI is not one person, but a team. And these are the member of the committees. And not just the committee that working, we have wonderful help from, from just about everybody. But these are the name of the, the face, just you see the committee around. So we have prepared a fantastic experience for you. Today is going to, going to be a live lecture, live surgery, and wet lab. And tomorrow will be a proctor surgery. So, but first, may I ask uh, Ajahn Galayani to come to the podium to give her welcome remarks. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you, Dr. Puwat. Good morning to everybody. Uh, dear uh, distinguished uh, speakers, colleagues, and friends, and all the guests. Uh, where are my slides? <laughs> so our DSEC skills transfer course is organized because of some reasons. Uh, first of all, somebody, uh, someone in this room may not be accustomed to the word DSEC. Some are not called neurosurgeons, okay. So uh, briefly, this surgery is a tra endothelium uh, uh, transplantation. It's like we are transplanting only the back part of the cornea, about, uh, let's say, 10 to 50, uh, 20% uh, thick into the uh, recipient and hold in place by gas or air tamponade. So there are no stitches. The benefits are m many, and it is, there are more benefits and less risk. And that leads to the, uh, another new standard of eye care for endothelial keratoplasty. But uh, in Thailand, this technology is not yet well adopt, adopted. And I have done a chart survey through our CSI's line group. The respondents are only 20, 48, which is quite enough because there are uh, over 100, about 150 surgeons, cornea surgeons, but the active uh, practitioners in cornea surgery is probably less than 100. These five questions are asked. And the first one, mo most of the respondents are in Bangkok, about 70%. How many KPs were done? About 50% did less than 10% of keratoplasty, not penetrating, I mean, including all kinds of uh, keratoplasties. And about another 30% are doing more than 21 keratoplasty for the last uh, 15 months or so. Among them, uh, among these sur surgeries, 77% uh, did not perform any d surgery at all. And about less than 10% has performed over 11 uh, DSEC surgery. So all the speakers will know how inexperienced are we at the moment. You have a rough figure of what you're going to teach us. And the top three reasons for the respondents that they think that DSEC, why is it not well adopted in Thailand is that I posted this uh, 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 six options for them, and actually the seven will be others, okay, but uh, the response did include these six. Uh, this slide is a little bit complicated, but I, I just put in the reason number one, and that is the lack of training 
For number two is the conditions that need PKs only. And for number three, uh, I believe it's, uh, it, uh, it's the condition, you know, what's the number? Yes, also the, the needs, condition needs PK only. So you can see that B, C, D, and E are the major reasons that they are not performing DSEC. How necessary is the pre-cut cornea for you for as a surgeon? 75% responded that it is absolutely necessary. So we, uh, this is a clear picture that uh, there's uh, the clear message that tells us that the limiting factors are four. Training, lack of instruments, lack of training, lack of corneas, and also the cornea conditions. What can we do for these reasons in order to improve our status? Donor corneas are very few, I mean, uh, comparing to our 60 million, 67 million population, we can retrieve only 700 a year. That is absolutely not enough for our patients. We, for patients who are affordable, they can have imported corneas from international eye banks. The major one are the U.S., which harvested uh, about uh, 70,000 in two, uh, year 2013, and about 20,000 are exported for international use, and we are among one of their users. And uh, I think that is not the solution. To get corneas from abroad, it costs us more. We should depend on ourselves, and this hospital cornea retrieval program presented by Dr. Basak yesterday was very, very interesting, and I think it is good feedback for us to move, uh, to consider some uh, change or some advancement in our techno uh, techniques in order to get more corneas. For PK, we use one cornea for one patient. So another way to have more available corneas is that we can have an expanded use of our corneas. That is, we can use one for cornea for two patients. That is possible by newer lame selective lamellar keratoplasty. Let's say this one is a DSEC where you can use the anterior cap for the anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Another pair is the DALK dock and the DMEC. You can use one cornea to get the donor uh, of the endothelium, which comes in a scroll like this, like in the picture. And you just place it inside the anterior chamber and tamponade it with the air. And, but of course, it has to be the right side up, or else you get failure. And that anterior cap, which is about 95%, is still intact, and you can use it for dark. And maybe some patients who really only need the anterior portion of the cornea, you can spare their endothelium and give you less rejection as well. In terms of instruments, those who think that they, are lack, uh, they, they do not have instruments and that, that's why they cannot start. Today, we also have uh, Dr. Basak and Dr. Elmer too that, uh, to in demonstrate us the manual uh, preparation and also the insertion using the suture. You don't need any expensive instruments. For those who are doing LASIK, you may have femtosecond laser. You can also use this laser to harvest, uh, to prepare your graft without buying another microkeratome. And uh, what can we do for the cornea condition? Not much, but because our, this is from Dr. Uh, Pinita, okay. The leading cause of cornea blindness is something that probably DSEC cannot solve. But with experience, you can use more DSEC in your surgery. I believe so, because that's happened to me as well. About the training. This is the, the reason why we organized this course today. And um, we are lucky that we can start with the very great support from all these uh, uh, supporters, namely uh, Utai Ratnin Foundation, my respected and beloved teacher, and their, uh, cur uh, the current uh, directors. They have given us a great support and you can, as you can see, that they sponsor everything from the venue and the OR and everything, including the inpatient. Co-host is the National Eye Institute of Initiative Project, Meta Pacharak Watraiking, where Dr. Puwat and Dr. Vivat, our vice presidents, uh, uh, work. Uh, they have also helped us a lot to doing all 
everything, including the handouts. And more importantly, this course cannot happen without the support from Visionary Internationals and all the speakers who kindly travel a long way from the countries, spend their time with us and give us all this. Yesterday we had a very uh, long discussion about the cases going to do for the live surgeries and tomorrow uh, on the proctor surgery the day after tomorrow as well. First, laid, uh, the team was led by Dr. Uh, Professor Anthony Audave, also uh, Professor uh, Dr. Sama Basak from India, and uh, lastly, uh, Dr. Elmer Tu from Chicago. And also, Princess Mother's Medical Volunteer Foundation have kindly provided us with the uh, microscopes for the wet lab. We actually had a, a pre-course wet lab uh, two weeks ago on the 16th, so that we get the all the audience uh, get used to the uh, how do you say the, this technique somehow, so that they can get more from this lecture from this uh, course. And uh, on the right hand side is uh, Mr. Sompong and uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Ratanapan, who has helped us a lot with these uh, uh, settings. And uh, also our team, both on the administration side and also on the uh, operating uh, OR. And last but not least, our sponsors. Okay, without them, we also cannot survive. So please, sponsors us all the way. <laughs> and uh, our committee, of course, you are, you are working so hard. Thank you, everybody, especially Patty, you, and Tulaya, uh, and uh, Mort. Everybody, they help us a lot, and thank you that for that. I, I will end by saying that starting, start by doing what's necessary, and then do what is possible, and suddenly you are going to do what is the impossible. And let's walk together, and I hope that that suddenly will come very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Karnayani. That's great. I just want to make the announcement that today's activities is being live broadcast through the internet, so you guys are all famous. It's uh, being live now. So anybody with access to the internet can watch us and, and learn, hopefully. Okay. So next is very important. So indeed, Today is the start, an important start, but we have a lot of work to do. The, the first speaker is um, Dr. Anthony J. Aldavi. He is currently a professor of ophthalmology, held the Walton Lee Chair in cornea uveitis, and is the chief of cornea uveitis division. He's also running the cornea and refractive surgery fellowship program. He received his medical degree from University of Texas at Galveston, he did his residency training in ophthalmology at Wills Eyes Hospital. Then he completed a two-year cornea uveitis and refractive surgery fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco, Francis I. Proctor Foundation. Uh, Dr. Aldavi received numerous honor uh, during his career, including the Alpha Omega Alpha Scholarships, the Heat Ophthalmic F Foundation Fellowships, and uh, important for me, the first Claude Doman Society Award. Uh, Dr. Doman is one of my mentors. And the Senior Achievement Award from American Academy of Ophthalmology. In addition to his very busy clinical practice, he also runs a very active research program focused mainly on cornea dystrophy. Recognized as leader in his chosen field of scientific investigation, uh, Dr. Adavi authored more than 100 peer-reviewed scientific publications has been invited to give more than 250 presentations, um, local, national, and international meetings, and serve as scientific review for 14 ophthalmology and gen genetics journals. Next is Dr. Sama K. Basak. Dr. Basak is the director and one of the founding members of the Disha Eye Hospital in Calcutta, India. Currently, he is the president of the Eye Bank Association of India or the EBAI, the Vice President for Asia Eye Bank Association, and Vice President for Cornea Society of India. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including the CS Rakshmi Award, 
um, the RP Dan Dana Award from All India Ophthalmology Society. He is also awarded the prestigious Professor L.P. Agarwal Oration by the AIMS. Internationally, he received Achievement Award, International Ophthalmic Education Award from the AAO, the Achievement Award from the APAO, and numerous Best Video Award from the ESCRS and ASCRS. He has written six books in ophthalmology, 22 publications in peer-reviewed journals, and Dr. Basak is currently the reviewer for several prestigious journals, including the IJO, ophthalmology, AJO, and BJO, to name a few. Last but not least, the third speaker is Dr. Elmer Y. Tu. He's a professor of clinical ophthalmology and the direct director of cornea and external disease section of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, University of Illinois College of Medicine, Chicago. He received his BS degree from University of Miami, where he was elected Phi Beta Kappa, and the MD degree from University of Miami as well. Uh, and he was admitted to the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society. He completed his residency at University of Wisconsin at Madison and the fellowship at in cornea external disease from Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. Dr. Tu received many awards from the AAO and he was he served on the American Academy of Ophthalmology basic and clinical science courses on cornea and external disease subcommittee. He served as executive editor for the American Journal of Ophthalmology, the editor for the American Academy of Ophthalmology focal point and serve on editorial boards of corneas and eye and contact lens. Dr. Tu has delivered over 30 international name lecture and has also received numerous teaching awards. He has been listed as best doctor in America for well over 10 years. In total, he has nearly 100 books, chapter, peer review manuscript, and abstract in publication focusing on innovative approach to diagnosis and treatment of infectious and inflammatory disease of cornea and ocular surface. Wow, that's a lot. So without further ado, I'd like to um, begin the proceeding by asking Dr. Basak to give his lecture. <laughs> uh, thank you. CSI group, the cornea surgeon interest group, in Thailand for inviting us in this DSEC skill transfer course. I'll be talking on uh, indication, case selection, and pre-off evaluation of these cases, and I do not have any financial interest in this presentation. If you see the increasing percentage of EK in US over last 10 years, and if you see that the because of pre-cut tissue, it has raised tremendously. More than 50% people are doing dissect or any EK surgery. So the points to me, it is more trained surgeons are there, expanding indications, excellent tissue support, and pre-cut tissue supply. And also, very important point is Medicare coverage. So. If we, 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 we saw our statistics in India in 2013-14, this is only with top 12 centers of India. You see that our main indication still therapeutic PK and penetrating keratoplasty. DSEC only we are doing 12.4% of the cases. And this is the figure in our hospital in last, last nine years we have just done uh, more than 1,500 DSEC procedure. Now we have six, seven surgeons in our hand. So DSEC indication is endothelial dysfunction. Where there is endothelial dysfunction, you can always think about DSEC. The primary, the first indication is pseudophagic corneal edema or frank pseudophagic bullous keratopathy with PCI well. So there is a variety of cases you will see in this pseudophagic group. Yesterday we saw a couple of cases, all are good cases. 
selected for life surgeries and also proctor surgeries. Then we have another group of patients, Surafeki corneal edema or bullous keratopathy with anterior chamber eye well. So DSEC is possible in these cases, but you need to know what is the position of eye well, what is the duration of good, best corrected visual acuity maintained after putting anterior chamber eye well. AC depth should be good, less eye well mobility, but you need to see that if this AC eye well is not stable, then you need to consider for iris fixated or scleral fixated eye well and exchange the eye well. So this is not the case for the beginners. Extreme cases you can do like stable AC eye well, you can do uh, uh, dissect. And this is like some experts can do with dissect, uh, AC eye well, pupil not in, in good position, so you have to exchange and put it in a scleral fixation eye well. Then another group of disease, this is the mo second most important, is the Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy. Here I found this, yesterday we saw about 12 cases and six of them are Fuchs dystrophy. So probably Fuchs dystrophy is more common here compared to our country. It is also common in Western world. So Fuchs dystrophy, dystrophy you have a range of patient from early folks now the in western world people are taking gutted changes with little corneal edema morning blooding and with less vision vision of six nine like or six six part people are taking those cases but here in, in here and in our country we cannot take up those cases because of many reasons in Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, when sometimes we do FACO, rather than doing uh, combined surgery, so always we give guarded prognosis to this patient. We write on lay sentence that dissect may be required later on. This is to protect ourselves. And also when you do a cataract surgery in a Fuchs dystrophy patient, primarily, and if you thinking that you will do a dissect later on, you have to keep your target is, that is very important, 1 to 1.5 or sometimes maybe 2. The target I will power is very important. Then we have another indication. This is uh, post-PK fail graft. And here that you have to see the BCVF of the other eye either the patient's spectacle or contact lens correction, and you have to see the other anatomic factors like amount and regularity of the astigmatism, cornea scarring, vascularization, peripheral anterior synechia, and the status of crystalline lens. So after considering all these, you have to choose whether we will go for DSEC or a PK, repeat PK procedure. So this is another indication. This is also important in India because if we see our cases, we do 55% of our keratoplasty are therapeutic keratoplasty. So a lot of people actually happens this graph definitely fails because we, we, we use less optical quality tissue and eventually we can do dissect procedure in these cases. Like this is the one-eyed lady she presented with one eye, such a big, uh, huge corneal ulcer, and we did first therapeutic keep. He was a huge graft of 10, 10.5 graft. Then eventually the graft failed. Cataract was there, so I did dissect combined with cataract, and this she is doing fine for over last four, five years. So this is one of the indication in our part of the country. Probably here, the corneal ulcer is also common. So you have to think this group of patient for doing uh, dissect. Then post trap tube shunts, ear tramponade is difficult. I think Tony is a master of doing this. We do less this, and uh, because when you try to give ear in that, ear tends to escape into the subscon space, and 
you, you will not get adequate tamponade in this. So also in presence of tube, there are certain clues are there. I think Tony will share those with you. I am sharing the case. This is a case I did over two years back. Uh, post trap, overhanging blade, gross corneal edema. And I did a dissect with IOL and the blab reconstruction. And after six weeks post op, you see the blab is now flattened. I, I did a scleral patch graft here to cover the huge large ostium. Then over a period of one year, you see the graft is crystal clear. So these are the some difficult cases we can also do. There are other indications like congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy, posterior polymorphous corneal dystrophy, aphicic bullous keratopathy, eye syndrome, then post-traumatic, post-HSB or post-CMB endotheliitis. Here the aphakia, you can do it aphakic. If the other eye is aphakic, there is no note to put a lens, but you have to be very careful. You have to do vitrectomy along with it. Still it is possible to do in aphakia. Aniridia also difficult cases. Uh, Aphakia with vitreous in AC, you have to manage the vitreous very nicely before putting the donor graft inside. If the IOL is decentral, you have to manage that. If the PI is large or large complete direct-to-me, then you have to uh, deal those before putting the graft inside. Then you have the, uh, we, we want to see the corneal thickness in case of uh, shed. And if your corneal thickness is more than 900 or 1000 micron, we will definitely, will not go for this egg surgery. So if you see my series, I have done uh, the series most important indication as around 65% is uh, Surophagic corneal edema or bullous keratopathy, PCIOL is the most common. Then we have about 24% of Fuchs dystrophy because I, am, I work in a referral hospital. Then the workup part, you see you have a huge, you have to maintain Excel sheet. Yesterday somebody has seen that Tony was maintaining some of the this parameter in the Excel sheet. So you have to put all these findings in the Excel sheet so that you can actually pick up certain points. So if you enlarge this like diagnosis, reason for doing dissect, BCVA of the same eye, BCVA of the other eye, diagnosis of the other eye, this is all important because you have to give some prognostic importance of certain procedure and you have to tell the prognosis of the disease like if the other eye is normal, this eye is aerocorneal endothelial syndrome, we know that it is a progressive disease. You cannot give a very good prognosis in this group of patients. Then you have prior corneal surgery, prior glaucoma surgery, then prior other intraocular surgery like uh, vitreoretinal surgery. Those eyes are soft, difficult to handle. And again, we have had a discussion like Yak PI, shallow anterior chamber. Today we will be operating on uh, this kind of patient, prior glaucoma surgery, all this. And then IOP, normal or higher. Sometimes we have to rely on uh, uh, finger tension. And then if the pseudophagic, you have to know the type of IOL, SEIOL, iris fixatures, PCIOL. If it is PCIOL, then it is in the back, in the sulcus, or scleral fixation, or totally unstable IOL. Then, if you see the yak capsulotomy, you have to know the, the size of the opening of the yak cap, cap, and also check for the vitreous in AC. There are other workup indications like USGB scan, retina stator, optic nerve health, axial length for biometry, biometry. Uh, if the cornea is edematous, normally we take axial length and K reading from the other eye or we take an average K of 43 or 44 or 45 or we can take the spectacle history up from the patient. Anterior segment photography for documentation. Anterior segment 
OCT is sometimes important to detect the soft epithelial scarring and in post PK cases to see the whether the uh, posterior host graft junction is very important to determine the size of the donor lenticule. Then you have to take the anesthetist clearance or cardiology consultation and others for fitness of the surgery. So fakie corneal edema, cataract surgery or no cataract surgery, this is a great debate and you will learn that normally the as a rule if the, the patient age is 40 or above, we always com do combined surgery rather than doing dissect first. Cataract after dissect is possible but you have to take care of the dolar nelticle. Uh, so uh, in some cases we need to uh, do uh, remove the crystalline when it is clear crystalline lens mainly in eye syndrome where the you have less space in the anterior chamber. Then I will of choice so cataract surgery you can do a, either by FACO or we do in India a lot of manual small incision cataract surgery. IL of selection probably the hydrophobic acrylic Acris of single piece is my choice or take is one IOL and in primary cases I do not prefer any yellow IOL. The no multifocal toric may be considered in certain cutcenters of the cases. Target is 1 to 1.5 diopter myopic and other investigation like specular microscopy of the other eye sometimes it is important to get the diagnostic clue why it is happen. It may happen with a good surgeon so you will see that that surgeon has missed the Fuchs dystrophy or Guteta in the other eye. So it also gives uh, confidence to the patient that you can uh, uh, counsel the patient better. And also you can guard your colleague. It is very important in, in a case of medical legal scenario. So ideal cases for the beginner is the Surufeki corneal edema or early PBK, early Fuchs dystrophy with cataract for dissect triple. We have both the type of cases uh, today and tomorrow. Anterior chamber visibility should be good. Central round pupil, no vitreous in the anterior chamber. I will in the back with good centration. Preferably no yak capsulotomy done earlier. And IOP should be within normal limit. With that, I welcome you in Kolkata. We are also called CSI, Corneas Society of India. We are having the third annual meeting, national meeting in Kolkata. I am the organizing chairman. On behalf of CSI, I invite you all to join our meeting because it is very close, only two and a half hours direct flight, plenty of flights are there and it is the venue is near the airport. So I will take care of your all hospitality. Please come to this meeting. It will be, Dr. Tu is coming as a guest faculty in our meeting. Other f five or six international faculties are also coming. Lot of Indian faculties are there. So you, you, we are, you are most welcome. Thank you very much. So, you know, while we're waiting to get the computers working, I can tell you that, you know, of all the uh, advances that we've had in corneal surgery probably in the last 10 or 15 years, this one's life-changing. And so I can tell you that, you know, all of those patients who are appropriate uh, from Dr. Besick's talk who have endothelial disease, it's, the DSEC is a much more comfortable procedure than penetrating keratoplasty. Patients are much happier afterwards. It's a safer procedure. Patients have a much lower rate of rejection. And as you get comfortable with the, with the procedure, you know, the, the, the surgery probably takes half to a third the time of a penetrating keratoplasty. So there's so many advantages. Not, and so what we'll be talking about later on are sort of indications that aren't the beginner's case. But as you become more comfortable with, with the procedure, you'll start to apply it to patients who may not have perfect ocular surfaces. This is ideal, for example, in patients who have glaucoma, who have received toxic glaucoma medications for their entire lives. They have limbal stem cell deficiency. If you do a penetrating keratoplasty on those patients, almost, in you know, th those patients are almost guaranteed to fail because their ocular surface is not hospitable. So if they have corneal edema and ocular surface disease, this is an ideal procedure for those patients because you're not interrupting 
all the nerve sensation of the surface. So there are many applications to DSEC beyond just classic Fuchs dystrophy or endothelial disease. Sometimes good is better than perfect. And so with DSEC, you get excellent results. The surgery is fast, and as you get more comfortable with it, fairly straightforward, probably easier than PKPs. Uh, and so it's, it's something that if you're at all interested in, I think you should really give some effort in trying to, uh, to pursue the technique. So all of us have different techniques, and, and as Pua was mentioning earlier, I think it's a real benefit for you all to see the many different ways that you can, you can insert uh, a cornea. And the reason for that uh, is that once you become comfortable with one, you can have all types of variations. And, uh, and they're all really applicable, so I think the commonality between all of us is that we have one technique that we focus on and we know the subtleties of. Um, and once you pick that, uh, you'll become familiar and very comfortable with it, so. Thank you, Elmer. Well, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here to speak. It's been about five months in the making, lots of emails, lots of planning. Uh, and now that I'm here, I really appreciate more than ever how much work has gone into preparing this course. So uh, this is, I would say, without a doubt, the best organized course that I've been involved with. And I've been in many different countries teaching DSEC surgery, teaching other types of surgery. So I'd say congratulations to all of those who helped organize this. I, g I give a talk, uh, not a talk today, but a talk on how to effectively teach surgery. When you're coming somewhere like this, it's only interaction for several days. We have three of our fellows here and one of our residents. In this case, we spend a year or three years with people teaching them surgery. But how do you effectively com compress that into just a few days? It's very difficult. But to even have a chance of doing it, what's essential is like this, an auditorium setting with good capability for a PowerPoint projection, an operating room with good microscopes that can project to an auditorium, having two-way audio and video feedback so those in the audience can ask questions while the surgeon's operating, the surgeon can comment, et cetera. Uh, and that's, that's really hard to come by. And you have that here, and it's really a wonderful setup, and I think today's hopefully going to achieve, and tomorrow, all of our goals, which is to, for those of you who raised your hands who said you're not performed DSEC, some of you tomorrow will be performing your first DSEC. For those who are not, it's going to be fun. For those who are not, Hopefully you'll learn enough after today in the wet lab, if you're going to participate, to feel like I can do this. And, you know, and all of us, uh, the way I learned DSEC is I went somewhere in uh, the United States, spent a day and a half, and I came back and I did my first DSEC a few days later. Last year I went to the same place, spent a day learning DMEC, came back the next day I had my first DMEC. The important point here is that you will become more confident with starting this procedure based on what you see today and you hear today and tomorrow. But it's really important then to keep the momentum to start doing it. The longer the delay between today, tomorrow, and when you do your first case, the less comfortable you're going to be. Uh, but all the information you're going to hear today will be available to you as far as the presentations and videos so you can review those before you start into the world of DSEC. So it really is a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, Dr. Basak got us started with a very nice introduction on patient selection. So I'm going to touch on that, but a little more briefly than he did. Moving into donor cornea selection, surgical technique. I'm going to break down the technique that I use step by step. I'll also be showing some videos of forceps insertion, which is what Dr. Basak's going to demonstrate. And then when I'm done, then they're both going to demonstrate their current surgical techniques before we break to live surgery. So patient selection. And this is going to differ, of course, in different countries. But in the United States, as we've seen here in Thailand, patients with endothelial failure from Fuchs dystrophy is a common indication. And this is one of the best indications for DSEC because these patients typically have peripheral corneas clear, just the central corneas edematous. So you don't have to use as big of a transplant. You can use a smaller graft, and that makes it easier during the surgery if you have a little bit smaller graft to use. So these are very good cases to start with. Pseudophagic corneal edema. You'll notice here, this is, I think, Dr. one of Dr. Two's patients, where you have an anterior chamber, in the anterior chamber, a posterior chamber lens. So if you, obviously if you put a PCI well in the anterior chamber, it's going to develop corneal edema. So in this case, that needs to come out, and the patient needs to have endothelial keratoplasty. ICE syndrome. 
I've performed DSAC for probably about 15 to 20 patients with eye syndrome. Many of these patients are young, and the decision then has to come, do you leave them phacic or do you remove the lens? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Graft failure. As Dr. Basak just mentioned, if you're doing grafts, if you do a significant percentage of your grafts for tectonic purposes in an inflamed eye, many of those times those grafts are going to have endothelial rejection. But if you like the topography, if the curvature is good, and the cornea is edematous but not scarred or vascularized, those are excellent candidates for a DSEC instead of a repeat PK. And endothelial failure, stromal opacification, and limited visual potential. So a patient, let's say, who has painful bolus keratopathy from a failed graft. You could do a conjunctival flap to cover the cornea, but many times the conjunctival is not mobile. They've had retina surgery. They've had trabeculectomy, et cetera. You could do a DSEC and relieve the epithelial edema and the boule with less postoperative care required as if you did a repeat PK. Those with previous glaucoma surgery, currently 30% of the DSECs 30%, I'm almost one out of three, are in an eye with a trabeculectomy, a tube shunt, or both. So if you start doing DSEC, you will encounter these patients. As Dr. Basak mentioned, it becomes more difficult because the air does not stay in the anterior chamber. It goes out beneath the conjunctival space. I'll show you some videos in this talk and then this afternoon as to how to successfully deal with those cases. Iridotomies. Same issue, you see here a large iridotomy in a patient with a ciliary body melanoma that was excised. So not only there's an iridotomy, but there's also been vitrectomy, xylar absence, so air goes right through that hole into the back of the eye. The worst thing is that the air goes behind the iris and then pushes the iris forward. Something that's very difficult to deal with, but hopefully we'll tell you today some pearls as to how to deal with that. Clear lenses, as I mentioned, we'll talk about what to do in a patient who has a clear lens. Patients with partial or complete aniridia. Here's a patient who's aneritic, has an Optec 311 iris reconstruction lens. There's still a lot of room around this lens, though, for air and possibly even the DSAC graft to pass. These are complicated cases, but still, these patients should have DSAC. This patient, he's monocular. He has, as you see, partial absence of the iris. He's aphakic. But for this patient who's monocular and who's in his 80s, much quicker visual recovery with a DSEC as compared to a penetrating keratoplasty. Much safer if he trips, hits his eye on the nightstand as far as not rupturing the eye open and losing the contents. DSEC should be done. It's not an easy case. It shouldn't be your first case, but that's what this patient should have done. ACIOLs. Dr. Basak mentioned that. I'll go into a little bit more detail about this. DSEC can be performed, but the question is, should it be? Should you take out an ACIOL and put in an iris fixated or a scleral fixated lens or leave the patient aphakic? Or should you leave the ACIOL in place? We have a study we presented at a recent meeting and we'll present some of the data from that to you. Dislocated lens. Clearly, this lens needs to come out. If you do DSAC in this eye and you put the air bubble in, it's going to push this lens even further out. And that patient is not going to see well. So your time to fix this is at the time of the DSAC surgery. Or if you wanted, fix it first and then do the DSAC later. A patient with an unstable lens, like this patient, whose lens is doing a little dance in the pupil, laughing at you. You think you can do a DSAC in this eye? Well, you could get the graft in, but once you put in that air bubble with enough force to get it to stick to the patient's stroma, that air force is going to push that lens into the back of the eye. You're going to be calling your retina doctor saying, I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, the lens went south. Prior penetrating keratoplasty. If you're going to decide on should I do a DSEC for this patient with PK failure as opposed to doing another PK, it depends on a lot of different things. What was their vision before the graph failed? If they saw 2040 with glasses and they were happy, you'd do a DSEC because they'll get back that vision. What's the vision in the other eye? If they have very poor vision in the other eye, you do a repeat PK, it'll be nine months, 12 months before they see again. If you would do a DSAC, they'll get good vision within three months. So especially in patients in whom the eye with a PK failure is their better seeing eye, you wanna really do DSAC to get the vision back more quickly. Do they wear glasses or contact? If a patient has a high astigmatism, which they've worn a contact lens for for 15 years for their PK, they saw 2020 with their contact. 
Well, I would do another DSEC. Even though they have a high astigmatism, they can wear a contact and it will correct it. If the patient, however, wore glasses, their best vision was 2050, with six diopters of astigmatism correction in their glasses, they're not going to really be that happy again with another with a DSEC and still be left with that high astigmatism. I would then say, I'll take that out, I'll put it, do another penetrating keratoplasty. Certainly do keep in mind as well, if a patient had a penetrating keratoplasty prior to cataract surgery, then a cataract surgeon put in a toric IOL, I've seen this several times, if you do another penetrating keratoplasty, now the amount of astigmatism and the direction of astigmatism is not going to be the same as what that toric IOL is correcting. That patient will be miserable. You're going to have to get that IOL out. Whereas if you do a DSEC, you're not going to change the amount of astigmatism. You're not going to change the direction of astigmatism. So that's sort of a case where you have to do a DSEC. And if you don't do DSEC, you have to refer that patient that does to somebody who does DSEC. Who is not a candidate for DSEC? Sounds like everybody in the world is a candidate for DSEC. No, there's a few people who are not. Corneal stromal opacification and good visual potential. So this image up here, cornea that's more than 900 microns. It's been like this, let's say, for a couple of years. This cornea has been so stretched out for so long, even when the edema goes away, it will never be optically clear. Just like if I borrowed my wife's sweater, she's a size zero, and I wore it for a week, I gave it back to her, she'd be upset. It'd be so stretched out, it will never go back to its original shape. It's no good. Same thing. In this case, this cornea would have to be replaced for that patient to see well. Silicone oil and a unicameral eye. Again, these are cases in, whom, in which any graft is going to fail. In this case, only a keratoprosthesis is going to help that patient see. So let's move on to donor cornea selection, something we went through in the last few days, selecting donor corneas for the surgeries we'll perform today and tomorrow. Typically, you want a donor between ages 3 and 70. We don't usually use young donors between ages 3 and 10, let's say, for penetrating keratoplasty because the cornea is very flaccid. It's hard to work with. It's hard to suture. It's very floppy. With the DSEC, you don't care. And the big advantage is that these will have very high cell counts. So if an eye bank has a donor from a very young, uh, cornea from a very young donor, the DSEC surgeon is the one who wants that as opposed to the PK surgeon. Obviously, serology needs to be negative. No prior history of corneal surgery, typically. However, there are a number of eye banks that will prepare corneas for DSEC that have had prior LASIK surgery or PRK surgery. It's just that you're taking a bit of a chance if you're cutting it yourself if they've had prior LASIK surgery. But if an eye bank says they'll cut it for you, they take the risk if there's any damage during preparation. If you're cutting yourself as we are today, you really want a scleral rim of at least three millimeters, 360 degrees. Not on average, all the way around. Because when you're mounting it in the artificial anterior chamber, independent of which one you use, you need to have enough sclera to be able to be held in place. If you have a leak, you're going to have a problem cutting that cornea. That would mean a total diameter around 18. I don't care as much about the total diameter. I want to see the scleral rim width. And if you're starting DSEC, ask the eye bank for a photograph of the scleral rim to make sure it looks like it's wide enough for you to mount it on an artificial anterior chamber. Cell count, everybody has their minimum. For me, it'd be 2,500. Death to preservation, typically we like less than 12 hours, but several of the corneas we're going to be using today and tomorrow are out to 20 days excuse me, 20 days, 20 hours between uh, death and preservation. Also matters, of course, how long was it before the body was cooled before the, uh, after the death. But death, the surgery, typically less than 10 days. The three corneas we're using today are all 10 days, though, from death to surgery. Here's a setup. You'll see similar, something similar to this in the operating room. I'll be cutting the first cornea with a microkeratome. Dr. Tu, who doesn't know how to cut corneas, will be using a pre-cut tissue from the United States. And Dr. Basak, who has no need for a microkeratome, will be doing a manual preparation of the donor. But at least you get to see this in one case. This is a Moria system. It's an excellent system. Again, thank Moria for being one of the primary sponsors of this course. So let's now move to the surgical technique. This is my technique, but a lot of the principles are going to be similar to those used by Dr. Basak and Dr. Tu. So we'll start with my surgical technique currently, move on to lens management, incision location, desmase membrane scoring and stripping, preparation of the donor, 
insertion of the donor, air injection, and donor button centration. I would encourage all of you who are wanting to learn DSEC to approach this like you did when you learned phaco emulsification. It's the same thing. You break it down into different steps. Wound creation, capsular axis, nuclear disassembly with a phaco, removal of cortex, insertion of the lens, et cetera. If you break it down into steps like that, you'll be able to identify which step am I having trouble with, and those are the steps you need to focus on. So let's start with current surgical technique. Are you asking for the lights to be dimmed a bit? Could we dim the lights a bit, but not enough that Dr. Basak goes to sleep? They're working on it. Okay. I woke you up. Okay. So we usually use a tree find to mark the cornea. This will designate the diameter of the graft we're going to use. Typically, a cornea, at least in the United States, I understand corneas here are a little bit smaller, Dr. Basak tells me, about 11 and a half by 11 millimeters. The normal graft size I use is about eight and a half millimeters. So that means that when you look at the smaller the two diameters, if it's 11 and a half by 11, I'm using eight and a half millimeter graft, I've got about 2.5 millimeters in diameter, the diameter of the cornea as compared to the maximum diameter of the graft, right? And so that means on each side around here, I'll have about 1.25 millimeters, roughly. So it doesn't have to be exact. Some eyes will have a tube shunt. Some eyes will have peripheral anterior synechia. There's different reasons why you'd want to use a little bit smaller graft. But by and large, make the graft somewhere around two to three millimeters smaller in the diameter than the smaller of the two corneal diameters, which is usually going to be, of course, the vertical diameter. So in this case, we're going to be using a graft that I think is about 8.5. I make incisions, as you see, with a diamond blade. You have got to be very compulsive with incision creation when doing DSAC. If they're not made well, they will leak, and that will kill you. So in this case, we're using a 20-gauge AC maintainer that goes through a, about a 1.3-millimeter incision. The boost and forceps also go through about a 1.3-millimeter incision, which I'll be using. Now the AC maintainer is pushing BSS into the anterior chamber to keep the chamber inflated. This dilation comes from the retrobulbar block. I'd say if you're starting DSEC, not a bad idea to use a general anesthesia if the patient's able to have general. But one advantage of retrobulbar block is you get a partial pupillary dilation, which makes it easier, as you see here, to visualize the decimase as you're stripping it off. What you notice I did is I just came opposite where my incision is. It may stay in contact with the posterior stroma with the decimase, with this case, the reverse Bensinski, and then went across again 180, and then just pulled towards my incision. The key here is not to push too hard. If you push too hard, you can start stripping off stroma. You'll notice a whitening of the cornea where you're pushing if you're pushing too hard. Now I'm going to pause for a moment. My incision I made for the boost and forceps is here. So I'm going to use the boost and glide. That means the main incision for the boost and glide itself will be 180 degrees away. This incision is only about 1 to 1.3 millimeters. This incision, I usually make it 4.5 millimeters, 4.5. So if you're going to use a boost and glide, somewhere between 4 to 5 millimeters is the right size. It's two-step creation. This is the first step, is I'm using a diamond blade to cut about 250 microns deep. Now, this is a specially made keratome from Epsilon Instruments. This is sapphire. It's not diamond. It's not that expensive. It's only 250 or $300. But because it's 4.5, it's just in and out. It's easier than having to use a three millimeter keratome and saw back and forth. You saw I just removed the decimase, and now I'm reducing the pupil. You don't want to shrink the pupil earlier because you're using the re reflex off the eyewall optic to visualize the decimase membrane. It's your friend. But you want to bring the pupil down now because now you've got a large incision. Your iris could prolapse out of it. You know from cataract surgery, once the iris comes out to say hello, it's going to keep coming out to say hello. So you do not want that to happen in the first place. So we're bringing the pupil down with myocol or myostat or whatever you have. There's the forceps. I always practice, even after having done 400 of these things, always practice first to make sure those incisions are the correct uh, width. And also, I'll get an idea. If I practice and the iris starts prolapsing out, I know I've got a problem with the iris. So I'm going to change my technique a little bit. Once I've done that, then I turn my attention. Usually the corneas I use are already cut by the eye bank. But today, as you'll see, we will turn our attention to preparing the donor cornea. This is the artificial anterior chamber. The cornea is mounted on this. There's just fluid in here. You could put in optosol, but in this case, it's just balanced salt saline. 
Now what I'm doing is I'm turning this knob, it's pushing the cornea up, it's called, it's on a stage, this is called the helmet. This is a post and a guide rail. And for those of you who are probably familiar with the microkeratome, this is manual, this is the CB, that's the motion. As I just go across, that's a little quicker than I normally do it. It's about six seconds you'll see today. There's different size heads you can use. The 300 micron head cuts about 400 microns deep. The 350 head cuts about 450 microns deep. So we'll measure pachymetry first, decide which head to use. It's a free cap, as you see. So unlike LASIK surgery, we don't want a hinge. We want a free cap. We replace the cap back on the donor cornea. Then we place it endothel side up on the base of a punch. And now we're going to punch. We need to make sure, we have to be positive, that the punch is within the diameter of the cap. If the punch is outside the diameter of the cap, you'll get a full thickness edge. And that's not good. So we're looking at here the boost and glide. This is the assistant, who's Neil back there, will be assisting me for this surgery. We're looking at endothel side up. We need to separate the two layers of the cornea. What we want is the one that you're looking at, is the endothelium is up. If you just pull, it folds like a little taco. That's not helping the endothelium. I don't use any viscoelastic in this surgery. So instead, we're going to break the surface tension between these first, and then I will make it easier to separate them. So I lifted it to break the surface tension. Now we're removing the anterior stroma. You know it's anterior because it has the mark on it. That's the mark I made when I prepared it with a microkeratome. The forceps pull it to the end of the glide. You have to be very careful not to pull it all the way out this end, which I've seen before. Then the AC maintainer is off. The boost and glide is open-ended, meaning the part that's up that you can't see in the screen here has no back on it. So if I just stick this into the wound, the boost and glide, have the anterior chamber maintainer on. What that fluid will do is it'll push the cornea out the boost and glide onto the drape or the floor or the assistant's face or something. That's two points off for style points. So you want to make sure at this point the AC maintainer is off. There's no fluid flow at all. I only turn it on when I can see that I have a hold of the cornea. See the assistant right now is drying the fluid meniscus that forms between the forceps and the cornea so I can see the edge of the cornea. Once I have it, now the glide's brought in the wound. Now I turn on the anterior chamber maintainer. Important point, I'm gonna back up for a second. Once I can see that I have it in the anterior chamber, you see I'm coming out of the eye to grab the cornea. There's other videos that may show this even better. You come out of the eye with the forceps, you dry the fluid, you can see then that you're grabbing the donor cornea. There's no question about it. If you did this in the eye, you wouldn't be able to see it. AC maintainer is now on, because now I can see that I have a hold of it as it comes into the eye. So when it comes inside the eye, the chamber is deep, it unfolds. Easy. I think the easiest insertion technique for anybody who can work with two hands independently. Now the next step is to close the wound. This cornea will not come out the wound if it's inside the eye and unfolded. But if any part of the cornea is still in the wound, with the fluid coming into the eye through the anterior chamber maintainer, it acts like a, the cornea like a cork in a bottle. Once the pressure is high enough, it will push it out of the eye. You know, I'll show you a video of that later this afternoon. That'll also be the complications talk. So you want to suture these incisions. Usually the large one, only two sutures is needed. The one that leaks, as Dr. Patty and I were talking about yesterday, the one that leaks is the incision made for the anterior chamber maintainer because it's round. So it will, uh, we call it fish mouth, that incisions. I usually put, here I put one in, but sometimes I put two incisions in. Then what you're going to do is you're going to put air in the anterior chamber. Not too much air. You see that I still have a fluid meniscus in the angle. But it's enough air now that when I stroke the cornea, the cornea will ride over the air bubble, and I'll be able to center it. Here's a technique I'm going to show you. This is called the interface technique. I'm going in through a paracentesis, touching the donor cornea. Am I killing endothelial cells? No, I'm touching the stromal side. Endothelium is down. So this is a nice technique if you need to recenter it. Sometimes when you're stroking the cornea to try to center it, it keeps moving further and further in the angle. In that case, you stop. Now I have moved it a bit. Now I can stroke the cornea with these strokes that start at or beyond the limbus onto the cornea to move it. If your eye is too firm with air, it won't move. Once you have it where you want it, now you use a 30-gauge needle, as you see here, long pass through the cornea to minimize the chance of air leaking. Now you're going to increase the pressure. The pressure, I like it high. I want it hard as Samar's head, and that's hard. Maybe 70 millimeters of mercury if I can get it there, 60 millimeters of mercury, hard. If the patient has a peribulbar block, 
Ask them if they can see the microscope light. If they can still see it, you're fine. But if they lose the ability to see the light, then the pressure's too high. In an eye with a trab or a tube, you really can't get it that high. Once it's firm, then I'm going to slowly withdraw the needle. This, again, is on air, and I'm pushing with air as I come out. Just like hydrating a wound, it's sort of you get emphysema along the track. Now it's just lights out for 10 minutes. You need to tell the patient you're, something's happening. If you just start talking about your weekend, <laughs> you're thinking, what the hell is my doctor doing here? They stopped, you know, they just lost, they say, no, no, we're going to wait 10 minutes. We're just going to be chit-chatting. What we do at this point, we give dilating drops to the patient. Because if you, we're going to dilate the pupil. Once we're done with the 10 minutes, you can either make a new incision if you have to or go through a previous incision. And you're going to exchange BSS for most of the air. So at the end of the surgery, you'll have a bubble somewhere around six to eight millimeters in diameter. You wanna, if you don't want to leave too much air, because if you do, the patient can go into a pupillary block. You do not want a pupillary block, especially in somebody who has glaucoma. Now, one other surgical video of a case. This is a patient in whom I've just done cataract surgery. This is a combined cataract DSEC. And I'm, in this case, I'm going to use forceps. This is, I don't typically use forceps anymore. I want you to see it because Dr. Basaka will show this technique very nicely today. In this case, you're just going to enlarge the incision you made for cataract surgery for insertion of the donor. So the same thing. You take your tree fine, you make a mark, say, how does this look and compare to the patient's diameter of their cornea? If somebody has Fuchs, you don't need as big of a graft. The peripheral endothelium is okay. If they have edema, limbus to limbus, you're going to need a little bit larger graft. Here with a dilated pupil, see how easy it is to see when you're scoring the decimates. Note also, I'm nowhere near being way out here at this mark. Even though the donor is going to be 8.5 millimeters in diameter, the area that I'm scoring, that I'm removing, is only maybe 6 millimeters in diameter. All you're doing this for is to remove the gutte. And removing the gutte doesn't need to be performed even as wide as I'm doing here. Make sure when you're stripping, though, that you don't get into the phaco incision you just made. And then look at this. Sometimes it's like this easy. Here I have the eye filled with viscoelastic. It is definitely easier to do this with the eye filled with viscoelastic as compared to an anterior chamber maintainer, which you saw in the first video, because it just stays in place. With AC maintainer, it blows the decimates back. You've stripped it, and it blows it back. It's a bit of a pain in the butt. So when you're starting the surgery, I think it's easiest to use viscoelastic, but you have to make sure you get all of it out. You only want to use a cohesive. Do not use a dispersive viscoelastic. You can see the gutte here on the excised decimase membrane. Good idea to look at it and say, okay, do I have the whole piece here? If you do, great. If you don't have the whole piece, you need to go back and remove the decimase that's still inside the eye. Now we're going to mark the calipers. We set them to, eight, to five millimeters. And so my incision in this case... This is an older video, so this was a 3.0 keratome, I believe. So I'm going to enlarge the incision to 5 millimeters for insertion. It's easy. I've just done FACO. This is, I'm right-handed. It's as well-positioned for my right hand, so it's going to enlarge it a little bit and then use the same incision to insert the graft using the forceps. And as I mentioned, though, you want to be very, very compulsive about removing all of the viscoelastic. Also want to make sure you do not make too big of a capsular excess in these cases. If you're trying to insert your DSAC graft, and your Iowa, Iowa comes out of the bag, you could potentially, as I saw a fellow do a few years ago, put the DSAC graft in the bag beneath the IOL. It doesn't work well in the bag. So to keep the lens in the bag, keep the capsular excess, if you can, a little bit smaller. These are the Ogawa forceps. You see they have a rounded end. They're like conjunctival forceps. These are meant to actually pinch the tissue at the very end. So you grab it along the folded edge. It's folded 60-40, as Dr. Basak, I'm sure, will talk about. And here I have no viscoelastic in the eye. It's just BSS coming in and assistance helping me. And then as soon as I say let go or stop, they stop injecting. Because if, if this is in the wound and they're still injecting, it'll blow it out of the eye. So you have to time it very well. Usually, in the case you saw when I used the Boosen Glide, my foot is controlling irrigation through the FACO machine. So I can stop and start. In this case, I had an assistant do it, and that works fine as long as your assistant listens to you. They don't always do that. So here we have the donor cornea. It's folded, so now I'm injecting air bubble between the halves. It's like a taco, like this. And as the air expands, it's unfolding it in the correct orientation. The big advantage of the Boosen technique over this forceps technique is you really can't flip 
the cornea. You have a hold of it with forceps. It won't flip upside down. I've done a lot of stupid things, but I've never b managed to do that. With the forceps technique, it can flip upside down. Same technique we saw earlier, that interfaced centering technique, before we saw it with a cannula. Here I don't have a paracentesis, so what I'm doing here is I'm using a needle, 30 gauge needle, coming in very flat. Probably the pressure's a little bit high. You see those little wrinkles in the cornea? That pressure should have been a little bit lower, but now I got it where I want. I'm gonna just stroke it a little bit to make sure that cornea is centered. And then bring the pressure up now to, again, high. 60, 70, if you can. Same thing now as we saw with the other technique, you just wait 10 minutes. So this is why the incisions have to be well created. Pressure's that high, if that incision's not well created, if your paracentesis is not well created, they're gonna leak. Dr. Basak makes great incisions. He, in fact, doesn't need sutures for many of his cases. I need sutures for mine. I don't make my incisions quite as well as he. But you really have to be careful about how you make those incisions. And here we're going to use a diamond blade to make another peripheral incision to drain the arrow out of. If you have a paracentesis you can get into, because there's not much room, there's a big transplant. But if you can use a prior incision, you can do that to exchange the BSS for the air. At the end of the case, I always use fluorescein to make sure these wounds are not leaking. If you have a leak, you will have a problem. Your chance of detachment is much higher if there's a leak. So you want to identify it when you're still in the operating room. So what to do if the patient is phacic? This is a 38-year-old gentleman with unilateral corneal edema of his left eye. No prior ocular surgery, slight pupillary peaking, clear lens. Again, he's 38 years old. So what do you guys think? What's the diagnosis here? Unilateral patient, unilateral, a patient with unilateral pupillary peaking, unilateral edema. What's that? Eye syndrome, thank you, you are correct. So patient has eye syndrome. So how are we gonna manage this patient? Who would do a penetrating keratoplasty? Good, if you're gonna do it, you can get up and walk out of here. Who would do a DSAC plus a clear lens extraction? He's 38, lens is clear. One, one sheepish, two, three sheepish arms. Who would do just DSAC? Okay, well I think this afternoon we'll look and see how do you do DSEC in a phacic eye? The one important publication came out of, well Frank Price published a lot of important publications. This is one of the most important ones, which looked at risk factors of cataract formation after DSEC. So if you look at these patients, what they found is that it depends on the patient's age as to whether you should do cataract surgery or not. For those individuals who are less than 50 years old, the chance of developing a cataract one, two, and three years after surgery, as you see here, is quite small, zero, seven, and 17%. If they're over age 50, though, the chances were 31% they'd get a cataract within a year, 46% within two years, and almost 60% after three years. And so then this table shows the chance of their needing cataract surgery, having cataract surgery performed. Again, it really depends on how old they are. So for me, if a patient's over 50 and needs DSEC, they get combined surgery. I don't care how clear the lens is. If they're under 50 and the lens is clear, I leave them phacic. So here's this patient after the DSEC. A nice clear cornea. It looks decentered up. It is decentered because I decentered it away from this PAS down here. One thing I've seen many times is if you have PAS near a DSEC graft, the anterior sneaker will zip around the edge of that DSEC graft and causing that to be much worse. So you really want to avoid putting DSEC grafts near anterior peripheral sneakia. So here's a patient who's 58 years old, gentleman with Fuchs and cataracts, no prior ocular history, visions 2040, 2070, two to three plus NS, and here's his central corneal pachymetry, 590 and 650. This is something that's similar to what Dr. Basak was talking about during his talk. So Fuchs dystrophy, visually significant cataracts. When do you see a patient like this, when you decide to do just cataract surgery versus cataract surgery plus DSAC? Very, very important to make this distinction, have a reason for to making these decisions. If the patient has any epithelial edema, in my book, they get a combined procedure. Why? Because epithelial edema leads to subepithelial scarring. If you don't address it in a timely manner, that patient will end up with subepithelial scarring and irregular stigmatism. They're not going to be happy. So you'll have what I have, which is about two dozen patients who have to wear rigid gas permeable contact lenses 
to manage their astigmatism that develop from subepithelial scarring. If you have no epithelial edema, but you have stromal edema, you have to decide how bad is the stromal edema. Do they have morning blurring of vision? You have to ask them about that. How long does it take to be able to read the newspaper? If they have blurred vision that lasts for more than an hour or two that affects their activities, they should have a combined procedure. Even if you see them in your office in the afternoon and their cornea looks pretty clear. Pachymetry more than 640 microns. There's no exact number, but I think most people would say if the pachymetry is more than that, probably go ahead and do a combined procedure. If, however, they have Fuchs, pachymetry is 600, 610, the stroma looks pretty clear, probably go ahead and just do cataract surgery in that patient. And then I don't typically rely on endothel cell counts because they're typically not very obtainable in patients with Fuchs because the gutte just make it such you can't get an accurate count. But if you do get an accurate count and it's less than 500, for that patient I'd consider a combined procedure. If you're going to be performing cataract surgery alone or cataract surgery combined with DSAC at the same time, you want to think about the chance that they're going to have a hypropic shift. They're going to have some hypropic shift from the DSAC graft. On average, about, about one diopter. So your IOL is going to, you're going to target more myopia than you would when you're doing cataract surgery in somebody who's not at risk for endothelial decompensation. If you use ultra-thin DSAC tissue, or if you start doing DMAC, the shift will be less, the hypropic shift. But there still is a hypropic shift even with DMAC. IOL powers, I'll go through this quickly because of time. Don't ever think about putting in a multifocal in a patient who has Fuchs dystrophy. Whether you're going to do a DSAC or not, don't do it. Toric IOL, maybe. If you're, if you're experienced at putting in toric IOLs, you rarely have to rotate them, and the patient understands that the DSAC can affect their astigmatism at some amount, it'd be reasonable to consider it. An accommodating IOL, again, you could talk to the patient about it, but because you don't know how much hyperopic shift they're going to get from the DSAC, it'd be hard to really make them exactly emetropic and get the most out of the accommodating IOL. So I would typically avoid it. A patient like this comes in, congenital glaucoma, monocular, phacic. You need to do, in this case, there's a cataract here. You need to do cataract surgery plus DSAC. This is like one of the cases we'll do today. The view is not very good. The question is, can I do a cataract surgery in a patient like this with corneal edema that does not allow me to see the lens very well? You should have in your office glycerin. It stings, so put in topical anesthesia, put glycerin on, and then with the glycerin, with retroillumination, you can say, yes, I can see this lens well enough to be able to do it. You could scrape off the epithelium in the clinic to find the same thing, but the patient's gonna be very unhappy with you. So when you're seeing these patients, glycerin in the clinic can be very helpful to decide whether you can or cannot see well enough to do a combined procedure. So here's a patient of mine, cataract, DSAC procedure. See that central stromal haze? It looks like scarring, but most of this, I think, is edema. So the first thing I do is just get that epithelium off to improve my view. Here I've done a small capsulorexis, probably four millimeters, again, because I want to keep the IOL in the bag. It doesn't have to be that small. But the problem is now I'm working in this space where I can't see what I'm doing. So low flow is very helpful. The Zeiss Lumera, which we'll be using today, has an incredible red reflex setting. So you want a really good operating microscope to show you the details you need. Here you can see it's not that great of a view, but good enough to do this safely. So when you're doing DSAC in a patient with cataract surgery and corneal edema, epithelial debridement, capsular staining can be very helpful, chandelier illumination. Does everybody know what that is? It's so using a light pipe that's held to the limbus can give you this great view of the anterior chamber that you may not have necessarily with just the diffuse illumination through the microscope. You want a smaller capsular rexus. You want to try not to extracap these lenses because then your rexus is going to be big and it may allow the IOL to come out of the bag while you're trying to insert the DSEC graft. If you cannot determine prior to surgery whether you're going to be able to see well enough to do the cataract surgery, be prepared to stop, do a full thickness graft, take out the cataract open sky, and then do a penetrating keratoplasty. If you just don't know if can I see well enough, one other option would be, of course, do a DSEC first. Then when the view gets better, go back and do your cataract surgery. But I can tell you that's difficult to do. Difficult because it's hard to make incisions with that DSEC graft in the way. So in a few cases, I've actually gone in the operating room with non-pre-cut tissue, 
two IL wells, started the cataract surgery, was able to finish it as a DSAC cataract, but was ready to convert if I had it to. Okay, if the patient's pseudophagic, as we mentioned, this patient's lens will need to be addressed, needs to be stabilized either prior to or at the time of DSAC surgery. This patient we saw already, this is a lens in the bag. This is a one piece in the bag. This lens should not be sutured to the iris, obviously. Some people are suturing one piece lenses to the sulcus. I think they're probably not gonna center as well as other lenses, that lens will need to come out. Probably better do that as a separate procedure from the DSEC. ACIOL, so here's a patient with trabeculectomy, two PIs, large ovalized pupil, ACIOL, significant corneal edema. I prefer to suture lenses to the iris. But if you look at this patient, there's a big PI here, a lot of iris atrophy, history of uveitis. This is not somebody in whom I think I want to suture anything to the iris. Patient also had a history of retinal detachment. Retina does not want me to do a transscleral fixated IOL. So this is the case who really got me thinking, can I just leave this lens in place? There was a, only one paper I know of in the literature that really looked at outcomes in eyes with ACI wells undergoing DSEC. In this series, they did anterior segment imaging using the Pentacam, which is not the best technique. They said that the anterior chamber depth was more than three millimeters. By this, they mean from endothelium to the ACI well optic. Rarely is it gonna be that deep. But in this series of 25 eyes, at one and two years, they saw 24 and 28% cell loss, which is quite good. But in my experience using both, as you see here, UBM, and on the lower image, OCT, you never see distances of three millimeters. This patient is 2.19, this patient is 1.84. Is that enough room to put in a DSAC? We don't know yet. I'm leaving all of them in place now. We have a prospective study looking at this. So far, so good. No secondary graft failures in this series of about 25 or 30 eyes with a follow-up of up to two years. We need to follow them longer, though, for sure. Here's one of these patients, for example, ACI well. Here's a, this is a, one of the few people who did have a distance of more than three millimeters. Here he is one year after surgery, cell count 1942, so a drop of about 30 to 40% at a year. It looks like he's doing well, he's 20-20. Incision location, I spoke about this yesterday while we're screening patients. Here's a patient, it's a left eye. I'm sitting temporally. So this is the Boussin glide coming in infra, infra nasal. So I'm having to deal with this nose here. So see the glide is like straight up and down. It's difficult to grab the DSAC graft out of the glide when it's up and down. Much easier when it's flat. But there's a reason why I operated this position. And that reason is clear if you look at the topography. Here's the patient's topo. Left eye, the patient has a high, as you see there's some skewing the radial axes, but a high astigmatism, 3.6 diopters. If I was unaware of the astigmatism or ignored it and said, I'm just gonna sit superiorly where I always want to, always like to sit, made my incision for the forceps here, incision for the glide down here, this is 90 degrees away from this, and would probably take it from 3.6, maybe up to five diopters of astigmatism. The patient's not going to be happy. If instead I do topography or I look at the patient's glasses before surgery, I then move to sit temporally, then place that larger five millimeter incision on the steep axis, this patient's stigmatism went down to about 1.6, 1.8. Big difference, so be aware of the stigmatism. As cataract surgeons, we're always thinking about astigmatism induction from our incision. The incision here is twice the size of your cataract surgery incision. You need to be aware of these things if you're doing quality DSEC. This is a patient who has a lot of interface debris. This is from wax cell sponges. This is one of the reasons why I do clear coil incisions now instead of scleral tunnel, because I don't get bleeding and I don't have to deal with these little particulate debris in the interface that comes from having to dab the blood. It's quite a hassle. I'm gonna go through some of this a little bit more quickly to allow time for the other talks and get to the operating room. But there are advantages and disadvantages with both scleral tunnel and clear coil incisions. Sometimes, like in this patient, the anatomy of the patient's face, in this case, the nose, dictates where you go. I mean, can you imagine? This is the nose up here. Look at this eye down here. It's, I mean, it's like not even the same picture. In this case, you cannot put a Boussin glide over here. Anywhere, it's walled off by this giant nose, this not monstrosity. Look at the nostril size, it's bigger than his eye. So in this case, you have to go wherever you can to get around this Mount Rushmore. Decimates membrane scoring and stripping. This is a video that shows the use of the MST instruments. These are very helpful, don't have any financial interest. 
many times when you're removing decimase, it can kind of shred. Once it starts to shred into pieces, it's hard with just the reverse bent Sinsky hook to grab those pieces and pull them out of the eye. So it can be very helpful to have these micro grasping forceps that are similar to what you see with capsular excess forceps, but the tips go up to be able to grab that decimase and then peel it off almost like a decimetorexis. So I think this is something you should have in your hospital if you're doing DSEC. Don't need it every case, but it can be very helpful when you need it. Same thing, case where the view is not good. Edematous cornea, you can't see, did I get all the decimates or not? Having vision blue can be very helpful. So here's an older case. You can see once I've done the decimate scoring and stripping, I've got a few tags, like one here and one here. And once you stain it blue with vision blue, it makes it very easy to identify and remove. And here we're just using a long angle McPherson's instead of those MST instruments. Donor button preparation. Very, very important. You'll see this today in the live surgery that I'm going to do in a little while. Here's the cornea. It's been cut by the microkeratome. Again, it's a free cap. You have to make sure that you do not punch outside the diameter of the cap. So to make sure you don't, what I do is I use a Sinsky hook and I ink it. And I mark the cap in four different quadrants along the edge of the cap. This way now when I turn it upside down and place it on the base of the punch, I'll be able to see where those marks are. And I place them 90 degrees away so the marks on the edge of the cap correspond to near the holes in the base. I just make sure that it's, the space is, dis, is the same, the edge of the cap from the center of the base. Once I do the trephination and I do the punch, then I always look at the corneal scleral rim. First thing I do, and I say, is the punch within the diameter of the anterior corneal cap? And you'll see here I'm looking at it. Yes. So here's the punch, and here's the diameter of the cap. So we're in good shape. If you have a full thickness edge, what you're going to be, well, the problem is then you're going to have epithelium on that full thickness edge. If you implant epithelium, that much epithelium in the anterior chamber, bad things happen. I'll show you this afternoon bad things that can happen. You do not want that to happen. Donor button insertion. So a few different techniques here. Here's the boost and glide, anterior chamber maintainer. As you saw here, removing the two layers to separate them so I can peel them apart. You know, I'm grabbing the exact same place the boost and forceps where I just grabbed the 0.12s. I only traumatized one location of the endothelium. Coming across, enter your maintainer is off, grab the button, the nose of the boost and glide goes into the wound. Right now I turn on the anterior chamber maintainer, and it's in. All right, another case here. This one I think is similar to the one we saw earlier uh, demonstrating the location of the incisions. Assistant dries, grab it, get the nose of the boost and glide into the wound, hold it in the wound. This comes all the way across. The button unfolds on its own. Then these forceps to let go, you turn. turn open the forceps, turn, and then come out. You don't want to pull the cornea into the paracentesis. I have a horrific video I'll show you this afternoon uh, from one of our fellows last year. So. DSEC and a phacic eye. All right, so here's the patient similar to the one we saw earlier, young man with eye syndrome, not much pupillary distortion here. Smaller button. We're not going to be able to use the entire diameter of the anterior chamber. So what we're going to do is make our incisions not 180 degrees apart, but maybe 140 degrees apart. So I'm showing, me, showing myself and the people are watching. I'm, rather than going here, I'm going to come over here. So more like 10 o'clock and 3 o'clock so that the forceps don't go over the pupil. So there's my big incision. Keep that tip up. The patient's phacic. You don't want to start a capsular axis with that. Same technique with a boost and glide. Again, I think it's important. Use whatever technique you're good at. The more you do it, the better you're able to do it in difficult situations like this case. So I've shrunk the pupil, obviously, with a meiotic. It's as small as you can get. Look at my forceps all the way on this side of the incision. I'm nowhere close to this side because I want to stay away from that pupil. Bring it in. Pull it in, easy. So the same technique, you just move your incisions a bit, you've shrunk the pupil, and you've got a good result. Both those patients 20, 20 years out after surgery. So if a patient's phacic, suture pull through, as Dr. Tu will show us in a moment, is a good technique. The glide is a good technique using the changes that I just showed you. Forceps can be used as well if they're phacic. You have to make sure, again, you don't go in the center of the anterior chamber but you move the forceps so that they only go over the iris. You want to avoid touch, of course, of the anterior crystal lens surface. What about this case? This is patient, monocular, 
aphakic, a little bit of iris left, tube shunt, doctor also. Good time. So in this case, when you're doing the decimate stripping, you have to make sure that you're going to grab it and prevent it from going into the back of the eye. This is another case where you need these forceps to grab the decimates and prevent it from going into the back. Dr. Tu will show a video similar to this. I've made an incision of the limbus, long curved needle that's going just peripheral to the mark on the cornea that I made, designating where the desec graft will be. Pull that one through. There's a double arm needle, so the other end is now going to go through the end of the Boussin glide. And that end that went through the Boussin glide is now going to go through the donor cornea. So instead of using forceps to pull the donor in, we're using suture to pull the donor cornea in. So we're doing the same thing we saw in the previous videos. We're splitting the anterior and posterior lamella. Now we have the posterior layer with the endothelium up. We're going to now have to pass the needle through it. There's probably a better technique than this because as I'm pulling, this crease is causing damage into fill cells. But the, basically, the needle's going to go right through it, it's go through the hole in the base of the boost and glide, and come back up through it, and then that suture will come out through the end of the boost and glide. This is very nice because, again, if you have a suture securing it when you're pulling it in, it will not drop into the back of the eye. You have a hold of the donor cornea. You just have to make sure that when you're pulling the slack on the suture, you don't pull the button out of the glide too early. So the, end, the needle that went through the, the donor cornea is now going to come through the same limbal incision and now just be passed immediately central to the mark made on the cornea so that the donor, when it's pulled in, will be positioned oh, just exactly aligned with the mark on the patient's cornea. And any time you use the boost and glide, you'll see this morning, we're going to flip it so that it is this way. This is the orientation. You put the nose into the paracentesis, the limbal incision. Now you pull on the sutures. And that, as you see there, the cornea comes into the eye quite easily. In this case, we're going to tie these sutures. It's going to hold that cornea into place. Although once you have the eye full of air, again, the air will fill the vitreous cavity. It'll fill everything. It'll even go beneath the conge because it can go out that tube shunt. doesn't matter. But once you have it supported by air, it's not going to drop posteriorly. You could remove that suture. But you see, I left it there to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. I'm going to skip through this again because of the interest in time. One thing I do want to mention is if you have a case where if the donor dislocates or it can decenter, excuse me, if it, if it detaches, if it can dislocate into the back of the eye, you always want to put in a safety suture. So here's a patient with a previous penetrating keratoplasty. They have an optic lens. They have a tube shunt. I've done DSAC and I've passed this suture right here, full thickness through the DSAC and the patient's cornea. So if it detaches, it will not dislocate into the back of the eye. That suture you see here can be removed at one month or one week even if you want. It served its purpose. Dr. Basak is gonna show several of these videos. I just wanna show one here. When you're using the forceps, many surgeons, I think, do you mark the cornea? So you want to mark the cornea to maintain orientation because it can flip upside down. So here's the use of the forceps. These are different than what you just saw. These are not the uh, goosey forceps. These are ones you see that go just beyond, the tips meet beyond the graft. The, 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 these are the goosey forceps, excuse me. The Ogawa forceps pinch the tissue itself. So you see it's a fairly, when you're good at it, as Dr. Basak is, it's fairly easy insertion technique. Here's another one. In this case, we're using an assistant to inject just a little bit of fluid as I insert the donor cornea to prevent the chamber from collapsing. But as soon as I open up these forceps, they stop injecting, so they won't push the graft out of the wound. Often, a little bit of the back of the graft is still in the wound, and as you see there, you just tap it in to the eye. So the last two steps here, air injection. So here's a patient, monocular, advanced glaucoma, significant edema, pressure is three. Can you do a DSEC for this eye? Pressure of three, soft, squishy eyeball. You have to do it for this patient because he's monocular, he's a professor, he needs to be able to see well. So the same technique with the boost and glide, just a lot less room than we normally have. Pulling it into the eye. And now imagine, see all of this elevation of the conjuring taiva? Watch that, watch this and watch that. As your air is injected in the anterior chamber, this could go through the PI, into the subconjunctival space, and the whole conjunctiva is going to fill with air. This is the joy of DSAC in an eye with a trabeculectomy or a tube shunt. 
you see it just continues to get bigger and bigger. And then the air finds its way through a small tear in the conjunctiva where you were fixating it with 0.12s. So when doing DSEC in an eye with previous glaucoma surgery, you have to be very careful handling the conjunctiva. You do not want any tears. Only when you're able to get all the subconjunctival space and the vitreous cavity full there will the air stay in the anterior chamber enough to get attachment of this donor. That patient is six years out from surgery 2020 on corrected visual acuity. Here's that patient, uh, this is a patient image about three weeks out, this time 2030. You would not get that if you did a penetrating keratoplasty for this gentleman. You can do this in eyes with multiple tube shunts as well. Here's a patient with three tube shunts, two PIs who successfully had DSEC surgery. But again, these are not cases you'd want to do early on in your experience. The last step here to finish up is donor button centration. We already saw the stroking technique. I want to review this because those who are operating tomorrow will need to get comfortable with this. Again, it's a series of rapid strokes starting at the limbus. It's more of a tangential. It's like when you're sweeping the ground. The broom should just skim across the surface of the driveway or the floor, not pushing downwards. That's how you get this cornea to move. It's a sweeping motion across the surface of the cornea. Sometimes you do that and it just keeps going the wrong direction. In that case, you're going to use the interface technique. Again, here's another example of that. It's decentered to this side. You want, as you see here, air in the eye, but still with a fluid meniscus. So it's not firm, but it's firm enough. There's enough air now that you can just roll this graft over the top of the air bubble, as you see there, to get it where you want it. And again, if it's decentered in a direction where you don't have a paracentesis to go through, then you're going to use a 30 gauge needle to do the same thing. See here, very easy as I come in very flat to push this. You want to push somewhere between the middle of the cornea and maybe out a third. If you push only the very edge of the graft, it won't go anywhere. So you have to push in the right place. So that's that technique. I'm going to turn it over right now to Dr. Tu, who's going to show us his technique for DSEC insertion using a suture. Okay, so um, this is something that I have been using ever since I started DSEC. And Actually, at our program, our fellow started, was the first person to do a DSEC, and I, I, I watched him and saw him struggle, and saw one of the graphs pop out, just like Dr. Uh, uh, Aldabe was talking about earlier uh, with irrigation. And so I thought that it would be simpler, there must be a simpler way. And so I came up with this, uh, this, part, this technique, at least, for myself about, uh, ten year, uh, about eight to nine years ago. So uh, there, are very, uh, there are variations, one of which Dr. Uh, Aldabe showed you earlier? Is it not coming up? Okay, so as I was mentioning, there are a few advantages to the suture pull-through technique. One, it's extremely simple, and I can bet you that most of you already have the equipment you need in your operating room, so there's no special equipment needed. Uh, as far as the, uh, um, uh, the instruments, they're pretty much all disposable. Uh, there's very good tissue control, so if you have a patient who uh, you're concerned about a fakia or an ACI well or something like that, the, the uh, suture pull-through technique is really ideal in those particular situations. It really it prevents ejection of the uh, tissue off the field, as Dr. Aldave was talking about earlier. And the nice thing about the preparation is that there's really no, there's never any endothelial pressure, meaning that you never touch the endothelium, you never squeeze anything, uh, and uh, you really have uh, a, a very nice uh, no-touch technique for the graft. The other nice thing about it, as Dr. Aldave was showing, is that that suture that you use to deliver the graft can remain. It can remain uh, usually until the next day. And so even if your graft is dislocated the next day, you have a point of reference, and it's easy to rebubble re at the slit lamp. Uh, and if you're worried about uh, centration or attachment, you can even leave that in for several days afterwards uh, with minimal discomfort. It really allows for a more natural positioning for the graft. Um, some of the disadvantages are there's a lot of suture on the field, so you got to make sure that everything is oriented properly, that your that your needles are exiting the correct location, and the, the and the graft is uh, is going to go in smoothly. So let's talk about this is a synopsis of the technique, uh, and this is not real time uh, video, but this is one of the first cases I did back probably in 2007 or 2008. All right, this is a this will be a video basically just showing the entire technique in very under two minutes. But we'll go through each individual step uh, quickly to kind of give you an idea. Just like Dr. Basic and Dr. Aldave, it's very important to mark uh, where you're expecting the graft to sit. Um, with the desmetorexis, uh, uh, you want to you want to basically have a continuous uh, uh, tear of decimase membrane. 
It is easiest. You would think that you'd want to concentrate on one surgery, uh, but it is actually fairly easy to do the desmetorexis under viscoelastic. So if you have a patient who needs combined surgery with Fuchs dystrophy for, dystrophy, for example, who needs a cataract, those patients are not bad candidates as your first case. Uh, so consider doing that. This is a donor preparation. Basically, you put a little bit of viscoelastic on the endothelium. Uh, in this case, you uh, will fold the uh, tissue 50-50, and I'll show you different techniques to minimize the manipulation of the graft. There's a needle that's placed uh, through the distal portion uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the folded taco, uh, basically, and this is set aside. You return to the eye and basically make an incision that's about a half a millimeter larger than half the size of your transplant, because your transplant is cut in, uh, is folded in half. And here's the key, as Dr. Aldave was showing earlier, was basically um, I mean, here's uh, making sure the decimase is in, intact. Is really taking these sutures and bringing it right across. Since you have your cornea marked, you know exactly where your transplant should sit. So you can go ahead and take these uh, needles across as a double arm suture. You bring that onto the field now that you've passed both sutures. You grab both, and you bring it to the wound edge and you tap a little bit and you can easily uh, implant the graft into the eye. This is not a bimanual technique, it's a single-handed technique. Uh, here, uh, as Dr. Aldavi mentioned, you want to prevent the tissue from shooting out of the eye, but remember, the suture is in place, so it's impossible for this not to exit the eye, but to end up on your lap. So once you have that, go ahead and place some air in there. You can uh, use a needle to manipulate it. Uh, I've changed, obviously, to Dr., uh, what Dr. Aldave showed recently, which is to go into the stromal interface. Uh, and here you can uh, easily center the graft, put air in, and you're done. So in terms of uh, the individual steps, graft sizing, uh, I've done grafts as small as five and a half millimeters. And so these, uh, that doesn't affect how it uh, adheres to the back of the eye. If you have a small graft, for example, you can do a graft that's six and a half, seven millimeters, or seven and a half millimeters. As Dr. Aldave mentioned, if you have a patient with global endothelial dysfunction, like you would have after a cataract surgery or, or pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, you want to size it a little bit larger. With Fuchs dystrophy, it should be smaller. And I, I would really strongly uh, reinforce uh, Dr. Aldave's contention that you should make the desmetorexis smaller than your transplant. And the reason for that, I learned the hard way, is that I made one a little bit larger. And that area of bare decimase took about three months uh, to, to cover. And that patient had persistent corneal edema peripherally, even though the graft uh, essentially did quite well. So you can see here, uh, basically, the graft is going to be a little bit smaller uh, than your mark. In terms of insertion of the anterior chamber maintainer, this is a pearl, something that uh, Dr. Odavi is talking about, how these uh, peripheral, especially for the anterior chamber maintainer, they have a tendency to leak. So here, uh, the way I make uh, the anterior chamber entry is not radial. You want this neck to be as long as possible. So you want this to go ahead. Uh, you don't want the tip of the anterior chamber maintainer to be interfering with your graft. So this is you want to do a tangential entry uh, with your MVR blade. And that way, as you see, once you put the anterior chamber maintainer in place, this is actually shooting down towards nine or towards six o'clock or away from your, uh, away from your uh, paracentesis. And also the edge of this doesn't interfere with your graft sitting properly on the eye. And these seal much better. And the reason is that they're a longer incision and uh, they're slightly eccentric. Next, as far as the desmetorexis, uh, there are many ways to remove decimase, and you can see here that um, uh, I'm not going to go over this too much, but you want to make a very small entry for your reverse Sinsky. If it's too large and you don't have an anterior chamber maintainer, that's a real problem. But even if you have an anterior chamber maintainer, if that paracentesis is too large, you're going to get so much leaking uh, that the anterior chamber will flatten uh, constantly while you're doing a desmetorexis. You want to basically trace a continuous circle. I'm not going to show this video, but I will show these two videos um, of doing a desmetorexis in two ways. One, uh, Dr. Aldave had shown earlier, is if it's under viscoelastic, I found no difference in attachment and using viscoelastic for the desmetorexis versus not. So if you feel more comfortable doing it, especially in your initial cases, using viscoelastic is fine, especially if it's in conjunction with a cataract surgery. Uh, recently, as we've um, uh, gone to DMEC, uh, the, you can do the desmetorexis, uh, as you can see here, under air. And so you want to make a couple of small incisions. Let's see here. So 
So you've made two small incisions so you have good access. Uh, and here we're basically filling the anterior chamber with air. This, this pupil is either dilated or undilated. It really doesn't matter too much. The visualization with the under air is better than you'll get either with BSS or uh, with viscoelastic. And you'll see here in just a moment as we use a reverse Sinsky, we're sort of filling the anterior chamber. You can actually see Decime scroll back on itself and exactly where you've removed it. In fact, if there are small tags of decimes, under air you can see them very easily and you can actually scratch those off and remove them uh, as you like. I think it's actually very important. So if you just have air, you want these to be very small side port incisions, under a millimeter if at all possible. Uh, you won't get a full air fill the whole time. There's not an anterior chamber maintainer. You can hook up your anterior cha chamber maintainer to air if you want to, to try to keep air in the anterior chamber. But basically, if you run out of air as you're going around, you can always just refill it. But I just want, I'm not going to show you the whole thing. I just want you to see what decimase looks like as it's reflected back uh, under air. And Patty, you were mentioning you guys use air for this as well, yeah. So this, is, uh, this has been something that I've recently started, and it's, uh, it's actually much better than any of the other techniques in terms of visualizing decimase membrane as you strip it. Okay, so here uh, you can see the reverse Sinsky being placed into the eye. You're going to lose a little bit of air, even though the paracentesis are fairly small. But if you go ahead and uh, you do the same sort of stripping uh, all the way around, you can see already, I think, that there's a little reflex between the air and the decimase that you can see where you've actually gone. Oh. All right, we're going to move on. Okay, so preparation of the donor tissue. This is actually a key part of the suture pull-through. And basically, uh, the tissue is folded in half. And you can see here on the video as we start it, and hopefully it'll complete properly, is that you really don't touch a tissue at all. You saw in the original video, I actually used forceps to, to flip this over. We put a little bit of viscoelastic, and it can be very, very minimum viscoelastic. You can go ahead and take the needle and actually use that to manipulate your graft. And what you're going to be doing is you're only going to be touching the stromal side. So you know that this is pre-cut. This is a pre-cut tissue. If you find the, the border, you can just use this, basically, and use it to catch some of the stromal fibers and move it over. So here, there's been absolutely no pressure on the endothelium. There's absolutely no pressure on the tissue. And then here, you, you'll bring the tissue over. And as I was showing you earlier, you're passing the needle through the end of the fold. And so if you look at the schematic on the bottom right here, you'll see that that needle is going directly through here, and you end up with two needles, a double-armed, coming through uh, the graft over here. And so the key of this is that the needle is going in through stroma, and it's coming out through stroma. So when you implant this into the eye, it's impossible for this to be, be misoriented, meaning that there, it will always be stroma to stroma. It will never flip. If it does flip, you'll know immediately. And it's very easy to fix also because if you just pull up on the sutures, the stroma will automatically, in those two positions, come right up against the back of the cornea. So if you have a patient with a poor view, for example, where you're worried that you're going to lose orientation of the transplant, this is an ideal technique because there's no way for this transplant to be placed upside down. Okay, so uh, as Dr. Aldavi and I think Dr. Basak was talking about earlier, you can do this as a sutureless surgery. And one of the epiphanies I had was that if you make the, as a, this is the formula for making the wound, you want to make it uh, half the graft, which is eight millimeters, add a half millimeter just for extra size. You can actually put it through a four millimeter incision if you want. But the key here is, and you'll see on the schematic down below, is you want to make the entry of that incision inside the area of your transplant. And the reason for that is that once you open up the transplant, the transplant then will tamponade the internal ostium. And so you really don't need to place a suture because if you have the eye pressurized and there's enough air in there, the graft itself will actually seal the incision. And just as a schematic you'll see on the bottom right here is that you make that incision so that and the entire internal part of the incision is underneath the transplant, okay? So once that transplant opens, that the air will not come out even if you don't suture that wound. Okay, now once you've had that wound created, uh, this is the way you pass uh, the, uh, the graft into the eye. You can see this has a very poor view, but basically you have the graft here. You pass the two sutures across. And in the US we have uh, curved needles, but I started this with the straight needles that we'll be using today, and it works just as well. 
Uh, in patients who have a large nose, it can be a little bit more difficult in, if you pass them nasally. The other nice thing about this technique, as Dr. Aldawi has mentioned, you can do this really from ori any orientation. You can do superior, you can do temporal, you can even insert something from the nasal portion to the temporal portion if you wanted to. So here you can see the view is terrible. You've marked the cornea, however, so you know exactly where uh, your transplant should rest. Very important is that you pass the needle into the, into the tunnel. You want to move it back and forth to make sure that you're not caught in a false tunnel. And then once you do that, you can bring the needle all the way across to the other side, precisely exactly where your transplant's supposed to be. And then you go ahead and drive that needle right through the cornea, coming out the other side. So once it's out there, you can go ahead and grab that. Now it's very important, no matter what you have in terms of how thick the tissue is, is that these needles be separated. If they're too close together, they're going to cause the transplant to fold. So you want these to be at least a millimeter to a millimeter and a quarter apart from each other as they exit the transplant. That way they have a tendency to pull the transplant flat rather than causing a fold in the center. And here's the, as I mentioned, this is the most complicated part of this, is really to make sure you don't cross your sutures. If you cross your sutures, you'll know immediately. Um, that's not a problem. You can still deliver the transplant. That's not a, and all you have to do is remove the suture. You won't have a suture at the end of the case. So when you take a look at the tissue, you know how it's going to open. So you want the right-handed suture to go to the right-handed side. You want the left-handed suture to go to the left-handed side after the tissue is open. So here you can see as we go across the anterior chamber with the second suture. Again, it's going to be about a millimeter to a millimeter and a quarter away from the other at exit. You want them to be fairly even as far as on the rim uh, that you had previously marked. So once you've drawn the two needles out, now you have the double arm suture. You can bring the, uh, you can bring the tissue near the field. I usually use a needle driver to grab both, uh, both sutures. And you don't worry about how long one or the other is because it'll sort of self-regulate as you pull it through. And then you bring the graft right up to the margin here. You have a hold of both sutures. And you can just draw the tissue into the eye. So there's no pressure on the graft. There's viscoelastic. It's 50-50, so there's no 60-40 fold that exposed, uh, may expose 10% of the graft as it goes through the tunnel. And you tap on the end just to make sure the tail gets into the eye. And it should be reasonably well positioned at that point. And so what you'll see on the schematic on the bottom right is that once you've uh, passed those sutures across, you draw it into the eye, and the tissue is here. The thing that Dr. Aldave is mentioning is that if the tail is still in the wound, you want to make sure to tap the wound a little bit, and it'll pop in underneath that lip so that once you irrigate and there isn't that anterior chamber maintainer, uh, that it doesn't have a propensity uh, to come from the eye. Okay, so most, most wounds I do suture, but there have been several that I have not, and so this, this is a pretty good technique in terms of um, uh, closing that area. Now, in terms of opening the graft, uh, Dr. Ardavi's already gone through a couple of methods uh, to do uh, here. Uh, the thing is that um, one thing you have to understand is that your propensity, once you get the graft in, is to try to open that thing as quickly as possible. That's the last thing you should do. Basically, what you want to do is to let the transplant sit for a minute or two. And the reason for that is that as it's in there, this tissue has been in dextran. It's been in a, it's been in a, a dehydrating media. Once you get it into the eye, it's exposed to, to water and balanced salt, the stroma will start to swell. And once the stroma starts to swell, it becomes stiffer, and then it'll open spontaneously. If you sit there and try to manipulate the graft immediately, it, it's very difficult to open. There's some surface tension from the viscoelastic that keeps the transplant closed. You can't get air into that interface. But if you leave it for two or three minutes, what happens is the, trans, the, the stroma will start to swell, and it'll start to open spontaneously. So you, you don't have to manipulate the graft quite as much. And the video that you just saw, we basically put a small air bubble in that interface, and if you just sort of encourage it over, if the anterior chamber is deep enough, it'll open that way. In many of these patients with the anterior chamber maintainer, however, because you're able to keep the uh, anterior chamber deeper, uh, these transplants will often, as I mentioned, open spontaneously. So one of the, if you have trouble opening the graft inside the eye, the number one reason is that your chamber is too shallow because what happens is that posterior lip gets caught up against either the iris or the IOL. 
So what you need to do is you need to overfill the anterior chamber to allow that transplant to open. Um, but often you'll struggle. If, it, if you have a problem like the, the narrow uh, uh, angle that Dr. Basak will be doing uh, later today, you can go in and actually use a needle uh, to bring the tissue over. And this is manipulating the stroma side only. Uh, a little bent needle, you can go in with a 30 gauge, sort of engage the stroma, and what you can do is then you can just sort of pull it open uh, this way. Obviously, you'd like to manipulate the graft as little as possible, uh, but if you have no other options, or if you have an anterior chamber IOL, which is the case in this patient, you see a closed loop IOL, uh, there are a few options to get the chamber much deeper, so you may have to go in and manipulate it directly. Okay. Now, the thing that uh, I like to see at the end of the case is really what I call the golden ring. So once you've uh, had the uh, uh, transplant open inside the eye, the key with the air fill, you can see here, the, this is the end position of the transplant. You see the, uh, the two sutures that are exiting here that you can tie and leave in place. You have your paracentesis here. You have a single suture here. Uh, the important thing uh, that I've also learned is that if you're not going to be manipulating this patient in the operating room is that you use a marker to mark all of your incisions before you leave the operating room. So that if you're doing something at the slit lamp and you need to release air or add air, you'll know exactly where the paracentesis are rather than having to try to create a new one. This is a situation where if you inject air, occasionally the air will go over uh, the transplant. And you can see here what happens is that Instead of lying flat up against the back of the cornea, uh, you see the air bubble here underneath. And basically, in most of these patients, as long as the eye is soft enough, you can massage that uh, air right out of the way so that it gets underneath the transplant, uh, and then you can start to refill. One of the other pearls I would suggest is often you'll get into these cases and you'll put air in. It's an afake or they have zonular uh, insufficiency. The air will go posterior to the iris or somewhere else, and you don't get a full air fill of the anterior chamber. Or if the air goes underneath the tra uh, between the transplant and the cornea, uh, it starts to become misdirected. The easiest thing and the thing that you have to do every time rather than continue to add air is basically you take all of the air out and then you start over again. Because what happens is that if you, don't, if you just keep adding air or adding fluid, the bubble will continue to go into the wrong location. So the easiest thing is just to start from square one, go in, remove all of the air, and then place it again in the position you want it to be in. And that's the, really the easiest way uh, to get out of any of these situations. I'm not going to talk too much about this. Normally what I do, uh, and this is my last slide, normally what I do is I'll do the same 10 minutes that Dr. Aldave did in the operating room. I'll reduce the pressure, but I'll keep a fairly large air fill in there. I'll take a look at the patient in the holding area 30 to 45 minutes after the case, if, and I'll sit them up. And if, if their air bubble uh, clears the pupil, then I'll send them home. If they're in, and every single patient will be in pupillary block if that air does not clear that uh, inferior um, uh, uh, iris edge. I'll go ahead and I'll just remove air at the slit lamp with a portable slit lamp until uh, that meniscus gets above the uh, inferior pupil edge. Uh, these patients do not have to lie flat at night. What I have them do is I have them lie at a 30 or 45 degree angle the majority of the evening. They, I tell them they can eat and they can go to the washroom. And the reason for this is that this suture normally is at 6 o'clock. And what happens is that if you have enough air to imbricate the superior two-thirds of the graft, the inferior part of the graft will not come loose. So these patients can actually sit up and they can do whatever they want. For most of the time, they're at home that evening. They don't have to position. Uh, today, I'm probably going to do this as a nasal uh, exit, so this patient can actually lie on their right side, and so that the, as long as the air is covering the area that's not covered by the suture. And these patients do very well. So, all right. Anyway, I'll hand this over to Dr. Basak. Thank you.